All right. Hello and welcome to today's event, uh, IPC in Urban Indian Outreach uh, Referral Settings. I'm your host, Kyle Mitchell. I am Dine. Um, my clans are Twitachitni, Nishle, Nakai Basishin, Ke Ani Dishiche, Nakai Dishinele. Um, I am a SEM or SME subject matter expert here with Nikui as a contractor to help um, oversee and guide and um, give feedback on the cultural relevancy of what we put into Nikui and our product. Uh, today's event is the first event in our Nikui project, First Line Community of Learning series titled, series titled Infection Prevention and Control, IPC for Distinctive Urban Indian Care Settings. Thank you. Uh, today's session will be recorded for educational and quality improvement purposes. We ask that you please place or please turn on your video if you can, uh, mute yourself if you are not speaking, and introduce yourself in the chat by providing your name, organization, and any tribal affiliations. Uh, we are excited to announce that continuing education credits will be offered to attendees of today's event, specifically continuing nursing education credits and continuing medical education credits. This is possible through a collaboration with Cardia Services, a provided provider of continuing education credits. There are no relevant financial relationships with ineligible companies for those involved with the ability to control the content of this activity. Uh, in order to receive your continuing education credits, you will need to attend the entire event and complete Nikui's anonymous event feedback survey. Upon submission of the survey, you will have access to the Cardia link to complete a brief Cardia evaluation and then submit an online request for continuing education credits. Upon successful completion of this activity, you will receive your certificate for one contract hour or one contact hour. This information will also be sent or be shared via email with all of you after today's event. Okay, you will see this QR code on many of our slides today that you can scan to complete Nikui's feedback survey and access your continuing education credits. After you have attended the entire event today, attendees at our events this year who completed who complete surveys will also have a chance to enter a raffle to win some Nikui merchandise. So please make sure to provide your feedback. We appreciate your input. All right. Let's see, okay, uh, for today's session, let's see, for today's session, uh, after this overview, we will move into storytelling, knowledge sharing, and UIO spotlights by the Fresno American Indian Health Project and Bakersfield American Indian Health Project before an open floor and the closing of today's event. Objectives for today's training include uh, to improve knowledge and understanding of key IPC concepts and actions, improve awareness of relevant IPC resources, and create a space for learning and sharing between UIOs. Okay, to provide some background, National Council of Urban Indian Health, known as NACUI, is the national nonprofit organization devoted to the support and development of quality accessible and culturally competent health and public service health uh, public health services for American Indians and Alaskan natives uh, living in urban areas. Nikui is the only national representative of the Title 40 or the 41 Title 5 urban Indian organizations, UIOs under the Indian Health Services, IHS in the Indian Health Care Healthcare Improvement Act. The CUI strives to improve the health of over 70% of uh, American Indian, Alaska Native population that lives in urban areas supported by quality health care centers. Uh, we want to acknowledge that Nikui is proud to partner with Project First Line as supported through our cooperative agreement. The CDC is an agency within the Department of Health and Human Services, and its contents of this program do not necessarily represent the policies of CDC or HHS and should not be considered as an endorsement by the federal government. 
Project First Line is a national collaborative led by the CDC to provide infection control training and education to frontline workers. And NICUI is one of more than 75 partners across the country who are working to provide innovate, innovative and accessible infection control education to help prevent uh, infection disease threats in healthcare. Okay, here you can see our presenters for today's event. In addition to myself, you will also be hearing from Alyssa Longji, uh, Dr. Risha Koshla, and Johnny Delgado during today's event. All right, so I'm going to share a brief story. Uh, the story I'm going to share actually comes from our relatives in the Northwest region. Um, and I, this actually came about as I was uh, speaking with a group of non-Indigenous uh, people. And they were talking about what, why do we call North America Turtle Island? Well, the tribes in the Northwest, the First Nations, the Iroquois, and a few other tribes talk about how Turtle Island came to be. So long ago, the earth was nothing but water. And there was a few... Uh, life in the sea, a few animals here and there. And then one day the sky opened up and Mother Sky came down. She came down and she landed in the water and she was trying to move her feet, trying to fill the ground and she couldn't feel anything. So she called out for help. She called out for help to the east, to the west, to the south, to the north and nothing, no response at all. Then she felt something under her feet. It was a giant turtle. The turtle moved underneath her feet and raised her a little bit out of the water. So she was a little out of water, but still not all the way. So she started calling for help. And finally, the animals started coming to her through the water. And they started asking her, what do you need? How can we help you? And she says, I need to get up higher and higher until I get back to the sky. And so the animals started going down and they started grabbing whatever earth they could from the bottom of the sea, the bottom of the ocean, and they brought it up and they started putting it on top of the turtle shell. And as they started putting it on top of the turtle shell, they started smoothing it out and rounding it out. It started forming land. And slowly over time, they started adding more and more and more. And finally, Sky Woman was able to return to the sky again. And now on top of the turtle's back was this huge land mass. And there were some animals that went in all the cardinal directions. And one of them was the wolf. The wolf went to the north. And as he was walking to the north, there was more and more and more land. And so they say to this day, wolves howl because they're calling back to the other animals on Turtle Island. And so now when you hear the saying Turtle Island, that's how we recognize North America because it was built on the back of a turtle. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now I will hand it off to Alyssa for today's knowledge sharing. Um, thank you, Kyle. It's always a privilege to hear you story tell. And welcome everyone. Um, my name is Alyssa smith -Longy. I am Fort Peck Sioux Assiniboine from Montana. I did, however, grow up on the Yakima Indian Reservation. I've been working as a public health program manager at Nakui now for about a year and a half on the Project First Line team. And prior to working at Nakui, I worked as a registered nurse. All right, so just for those who aren't familiar already, there are 41 urban Indian organizations or UIOs authorized under Title V of the Indian Health Care Improvement Act. The Indian Health Service, or IHS, uses four key categories to classify UIOs, and one of these categories is outreach and referral. As of 2020, there were only four UIOs who officially fit this classification. However, outreach and referral services are still important, and many UIOs, uh, many of the UIOs are offering these services, and so we do still think it's important to focus on this setting and this service and why it relevant to Infection Prevention and Control, or IPC. I do want to note that while there aren't specific guidelines for outreach and refer referral facilities, what we're going to do today is take some key concepts and um, adopt them and apply them to the services that you may see in these facilities. So what do we mean by outreach and referral? There are many possible services that may be provided in these settings. 
And of course they're unique across all UIOs, but they can include outreach programs at local community hubs or referrals to care such as dental or behavioral services. It may be a referral to a pediatrician, um, anything that that facility can't offer on site, they have the potential to, to refer out. And then clinicians are not the only ones that you'll see in these settings who play an important role in IPC, roles such as administrators, community health workers, patient transporters. It could be the person who receives the patient or client at the front desk. They all play an important role in preventing infection control um, or pre in preventing infection in healthcare settings. So just reviewing again the germ reservoirs and pathways, the, there's two key components of germ spread, which are reservoirs and pathways. Reservoirs that you'll find, um, it's where germs live and you'll find in the body and in the environment. Those can include skin, gut, respiratory tract, and blood when you're thinking of germ reservoirs in the body. And then when you're looking in the environment, the key reservoirs are wet surfaces, dry surfaces, dirt and dust, and devices. And then pathways are the ways that germs spread between these reservoirs or from one reservoir uh, to a person to infect, such as through touch by be, being breathed in through splashes and sprays when encountering water or body fluid and by bypassing or breaking down the body's natural defenses. So that could be through a medical procedure such as inserting an IV, um, which we may not see so much in, in these settings or surgeries. Also important to think about the reservoirs that you encounter every day and the pathways um, that you that are present in your daily tasks so that you're prepared to recognize risks. And also just be thinking about these as we go through some examples of services that you'll find in the outreach and referral setting. All right, so let's think about some examples that you might see germ spread um, in outreach and referral settings or facilities that offer these services. So there's indoor gatherings. This could be a group therapy session. It could be counseling, drumming circles, workshops. Maybe your facility offers group uh, exercise classes anywhere where you have um, a lot of people coming together in an indoor space. And so thinking of how germs can spread uh, in these type of gatherings, and it's not limited to, but some examples could be touched through dry surfaces like tables or devices or computers. Maybe there's um, pens, papers, it might be an art activity different things like that. And then germs can also spread when people are coughing or sneezing um, and people are around to breathe in the infected respiratory droplets. So thinking of some actions that we can take to address these risks, uh, we can maintain proper ventilation, which we'll dive a little bit deeper to in the following slide. And then also adhering to proper respiratory hygiene, so cough etiquette, covering your cough, sneezing into a tissue, elbow, and keeping physical distance uh, when others are sick. We can also make sure that we're cleaning and disinfecting properly, cleaning hands, engaging in source control by preventing germ spread, um, reminding folks who come to the gathering that if they're not feeling well to stay home, also having hand sanitizer in accessible places where people could uh, clean their hands. So now we'll look a little bit more at ventilation, and this is just a, a broad overview. There's a lot more that goes into this, but ventilation is a key aspect of IPC, and it's also relevant in these settings. Um, ventilation is important because it removes things from the air that should not be breathed in, such as small virus particles. But ventilation improves the quality of air and reduces the risk of germ spread. One key component of ventilation is an air change, which refers to the air in a room being replaced with new air. We measure this through a rate of air changes per hour, or you may also see it as ACHs. The number of ACHs can be used in calculation to determine when infectious germs are completely removed from the room after an infectious person leaves. And you should also make sure that you're not blocking vents, so no boxes on vents, or that you don't have a plant or, or furniture um, that could prevent proper ventilation. And we'll share links to additional resources on ventilation later in the presentation. Also cleaning and disinfection, those are important um, to IPC. Cleaning removes dirt and germs from surfaces or objects while disinfection kills germs. Disinfection occurs at the same time as cleaning or after cleaning and cleaning um, before disinfecting typically helps disinfectants work effectively. If you'd like to learn more, um, you can also watch this video that the CDC released. Um, you can earn continuing education credits when you watch these videos from the series. So looking at another example of some services or situations you may encounter in these settings. 
So there's point of care blood glucose testing or vaccine administration. This could be taking place within the clinic walls. It could also be taking place at a health fair or event. Uh, and then germ spread when blood that is contaminated with viruses or on sharp items, linens or devices. Germs can also spread when sharp items cause cuts, such as through an accidental needle stick or when contaminated blood spreads on linens, like dirty laundry or devices. And then some key actions that you can take to try to prevent these risks include following protocols for safe injection and needle stick injuries. And of course, uh, ensuring that your staff have proper training, properly disposing of needles, cleaning hands, and using personal protective equipment or PPE correctly, and maintaining proper cleaning and disinfection. And so looking a little bit more at sharp safety uh, and some of the sharps that you may encounter, uh, including needles, Needle stick accidents are the most common way that bloodborne viruses are spread in healthcare. Um, they can lead to virus the spread of viruses such as HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. But keeping in mind that needle stick injuries are preventable, um, there's, there's different actions that you can take. And just a few listed here include uh, avoiding recapping needles when possible, having a plan for needle handling and disposal ready for use, um, and immediately dispose of needles in appropriate containers. Also making sure that the containers are placed conveniently in your facility for your staff. They should be located in a visible location um, with easy reach. Below uh, eye level, the container should also not be placed near any obstructed areas. So not near doors or under seats or um, anything like that. And they should be clearly visible to the healthcare worker. You should also promptly report all injuries related to needle stick injuries and sharps. Um, and you can get your hepatitis B vaccine. All right, and then looking briefly at blood glucose monitoring, which is a service that may be offered at your facility to, pre to prevent blood-borne viruses from spreading during blood glucose uh, monitoring using finger stick devices, also called lancing devices. Make sure not to use the same finger stick device on more than one person, and make sure that you're disposing of used lancets in approved appropriate sharp containers. When using blood glucose meters or glucometers, do not share these devices unless you're performing proper cleaning and disinfection after every use, and in accordance with manufacturer's instructions. You should also make sure that you're following the recommended quality control actions when you're using the glucometers, so properly dating test strips um, and performing the quality control test. And then we'll also share a link in the chat for a new uh, resource that the CDC released on called MicroLearn. It's a series that helps guide conversations on IPC. Um, that are typically pretty brief and you can just infuse them in team huddles or staff meetings. All right, and then lastly, just briefly touching on healthcare laundry. Many facilities are doing laundry to help maintain clean bed sheets, blankets, towels, patient apparel, um, suits, gowns, et cetera. And contaminated textiles and fabrics, as I just mentioned, often contain high numbers of microorganisms from body substances. Contaminated laundry poses risk of infection exposure to not only the personnel who are handling them, but also the clients or patients that that personnel will encounter. So to ensure the safe handling of laundry, make sure that workers in laundry areas have adequate access to hand washing stations, um, PPE, and ensure that soiled laundry is appropriately contained and labeled to indicate if it's soiled. You, felt you also shouldn't leave damp laundry uh, in machines overnight as germs can grow. And then keeping uh, dirty and clean separate, ideally, and of course not having staff keep their personal belongings in the laundry handling areas, just drinks or bags or anything like that. And while high temperature laundry cycles using hot water is not required, when you are using hot water laundry cycles, um, you should wash with detergent in water that is at least 160 degrees Fahrenheit for at least 25 minutes. And you can also use chlorine bleach as an extra margin of safety and noting that chlorine um, bleach is activated at 135 to 145 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, so if you're interested in engaging in any other CDC Project First Line content, you can visit their website. There's lots of stuff on there that's ready to use and ready to infuse into your IPC training programs. And as mentioned, uh, we touched on ventilation today. There are many resources available to help your facility improve and adhere to proper ventilation. The American Society for Healthcare Engineering, or ASHE, is another partner with Project First Line, and they have a ventilation and infection control series, which may help you better understand ventilation and can go into a little more detail than what we had time to do today.
right, so I just wanted to pause now and see if anyone had any questions on what I shared today. No worries if you don't, there'll be another opportunity to ask questions towards the end of the presentation. And you're welcome to come off mute or put your questions in the chat. I have a question. How do you disinfect a beaded stethoscope? That is an excellent question. And it's something that um, our partners at the CDC have been talking about. Definitely something that we need guidance on. We don't have a clear procedure or protocol right now. So it's definitely a good question. It's something that's in discussion. If any of you have a, a way that you disinfect beaded stethoscopes, we'd love to hear about it open a dialogue on it, but something that we've been thinking about and trying to look for guidance on from our uh, CDC partners. I have a question and a comment on the first question, but my um, first question is that last slide you showed on the ventilation resources, what yes. um, page, is that on the first line? Is that on project first line or where can you find that? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. Um, so we'll share the presentation at the end of the event and on the slides, you'll have the links to, to all of the resources that were on there. Someone okay. from my team might be able to add that link in the chat as well. Thank you for bringing that up. That's excellent. So um, I don't know if the beads that are used to bead the stethoscope would have what they refer to as information of use on how to clean, but that would be a place to look. Um, and then of course, what kind of string is being used to put them together? Because a lot of the string, if it's a more of a, like a fishing line or something that's more stronger, could probably withstand more of a disinfectant and hold together better. That would be to find out exactly what they're constructed with to what to use on them before you would start, you know, um, using whatever on them, but that would be the what, where I would look to see what are they using to bead and make the different stethoscopes with, so they don't destroy them completely. That's, that's a great comment. I think that, Johnny, I don't know if you had anything else to respond to that. Oh, no, I was, was going to say, uh, no, that brings up a good point, because I would think, I mean, at first I was thinking, you know, dump in alcohol, I don't know, get some isopropyl, isopropyl, 91%, uh, whatever it is, and dump it in there, but you're right, it would probably destroy it then, so um, that's a good point. How about hydrogen peroxide or some of that ultraviolet, the, um, what word am I? Those disinfectant robots that they send into the rooms. The, the, the UV lights? Yes, that's the word I'm looking for. The I only issue I see with that is you can't get under it. Hang it. Crystal, sorry, okay. Dangle it from the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Crystal Fire. I'm the infection preventionist um, with APIC Consulting. Um, and this has been a hot topic. This is something that we have been discussing um, very thoroughly. First and foremost, I absolutely love the beaded stethoscopes. They are beautiful, but they are very expensive. Um, and I looked at the different materials that they are made of. They're made of plastic, glass, bone, and uh, gem crystals as well. And so for each of those particular products, you need to look at the IFU which is not easy to find. I scoured, um, I even went into different shops and so forth. There are no IFUs for how to clean these products. Um, and if we're using those disinfectants, they will over time destroy that. Um, so as beautiful it, as it is, I there's really no way that we can properly clean those stethoscopes. Um, and utilizing those UV lights, as mentioned by John, um, you would not be able to get in between uh, the beads or underneath the beads. And so again, CDC is reviewing this and looking at this. Um, but at this time, 
there is no guidance that guides us on how to clean a beaded stethoscope. But as long as you're cleaning your bell, uh, you know, clean that with alcohol between patients is the most important piece. But again, you know, what are your, you're touching that uh, part of the stethoscope. So just again, hand hygiene and so forth. Great. Thank you so much, Crystal, for that added input. Uh, it's definitely an important topic. Um, we'll have some more time also to discuss towards the end of the presentation, but I do want to hand it off here um, to Dr. Richa Koshal from Fresno American Indian Health Project for our first UIO spotlight. Dr. Koshal is a pediatrician and the deputy medical director at the Fresno American Indian Health Project. Dr. Koshal has extensive experience in teaching and providing pediatric care through her roles with UCSF Fresno the AAP and more. We're very grateful to have Dr. Koshal here to share her insights. Um, and I'll now hand the floor over to her so she can talk more about Fresno American Indian Health Project and their IPC activities. Thank you, Alyssa. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep, I can hear you. So um, Fresno American Indian Health Project, uh, it began in 2007 and it has grown to offer uh, many services, including many community outreach programs, referrals to care, many culturally based health and wellness services uh, to support local communities. It was previously classified uh, as an outreach and referral center, but as we are growing, we have now expanded to full ambulatory. And this is FAIHP's third year participating as a UIO IPC champion with the NICOE project first line team. I want to talk a little bit about the IPC assessment process that we conducted uh, at FAIHP. Basically, we wanted to assess how well we were following the guidelines with regards to infection prevention and control at our facility. And that is why we wanted to use a formal tool to assess that. So our steps in that were to review uh, various IPC assessment tools and resources from sources like WHO and CDC, from there, we selected the CDC's Guide to Infection Prevention for Outpatient Settings, as we thought that this was very thorough. We completed uh, three iterations of review and assessment, and we created and implemented processes between each review. The end goal of this assessment was to turn all the no responses into yes responses. So the three sections that we studied were facility demographics, infection control program and infrastructure, and direct observation of facility practices. Section four was more focused on guidelines and resources and was not a questionnaire that we filled out or used for assessment. We covered 13 domains in this assessment and those domains are listed here. And these included hand hygiene, injection safety, point of care testing, and more. As you can see, we scored a yes for 72% of the questions, and we got a no for a 2%, and then 26% uh, were not applicable to our facility. In terms of numbers, we scored a yes on 114 questions. We got a no on four and not applicable for uh, 41 questions. And this is just another way uh, broken down into sections uh, of the three sections of the tools that we used. I'm just going to briefly go over our no responses because the big goal was to turn these no's into yeses. So for the question that is the facility uh, AAAC accredited, uh, the answer was no. Uh, we're not there yet, but that is our end goal. And for the question is at least one individual trained in infection prevention and employed by or regularly available to manage the infection control program. Our response was a no, but we are in the process of implementing and creating a role for official training on infection prevention. 
regarding whether or not the facility can demonstrate knowledge of and compliance with mandatory reporting requirements for notifiable diseases and outbreaks? The initial answer was no, but uh, then we did a staff in-service and educated uh, all the staff uh, and turned that into yes on reporting uh, diseases. And then we delegated, uh, also delegated reporting responsibilities. Finally, we assessed whether or not our facility posts signs at entrances with instructions for patients with symptoms of respiratory infections to inform providers of symptoms and practice respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette by covering their mouths when they sneeze and cough. Our response was no. Uh, we did do this screening over the phone during COVID, but uh, there were no signs posted around the facility. So we are working on posting these signs now. I would like to open the floor for any questions. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that last part on the signs posted. Uh, uh, what signs again? So you know how you should cover your mouth when you're sneezing or uh, uh, wear a mask if you're sick. We, we, we are working on posting those signs uh, over uh, around at our facility. Do you have any um, signs that are, how do you say, indigenized? Signs that are indigenized? Not yet, but that that is what we, we will only be posting uh, ind indigenized signs. And that, that, that has already been discussed. Awesome, great idea. We have a hard time. Uh, finding indigenized materials. So uh, it'd be great if you could maybe share when you guys come out with something. We'd Absolutely. Appreciate that. Absolutely. And um, yeah, our organization is uh, even the art and uh, all the paintings in our clinic is also um, all indigenous from a local indigenous painter. So we, and then, and actually that is the reason why it's been taking so long to uh, get those signs posted. That's awesome. I wish I could see it. <laughs> I'd be happy to, as soon as we get something uh, uh, indigenous, like science, I'm happy to uh, share them with you. Awesome. Thank you, doctor. Appreciate it. Of course. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Felicia Batts. I'm also from Fresno American Indian Health Project. And Jody, I see your question about the level of training you're recommending for your ICP or IPC specialist. Um, we've had the worst luck with turnover. And um, what we really wanted was a public health nurse to kind of hold this item and um, become that certified champion. And we've lost three in the past three years. <laughs> So it's been very difficult, but our um, LPN has been here consistently and strong for the past three years. So we have identified a program that she can um, go to and gain the certification. So to answer your question, the level we're looking at right now is um, our licensed vocational nurse. I hope that answers your question, Jody. Um, yes, thank you. We're, um, I think, going to have the same challenges with our Montana UIOs um, with turnover and then just staff capacity to do the training. And then some of the requirements, I guess, our concern with the actual um, CIC certification is the job description piece. And there's just a lot of levels to that um, for someone who is doing that just as one small part of their job. Um, so it just seems like that's more hospital centric, that training. Um, so I just wondered if anybody had any ideas or thoughts on other trainings that could be recommended. Yeah, we're definitely going to be on that journey. So we haven't even gotten okay. to the job description overhaul in adding okay. that. Okay, yes. Oh, <laughs> yeah. But that's coming. That's coming. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank Jody, you. Yes. Anyone Jody, have I'd ideas? Like to, I'd like to add something. There's two trainings. There's the CIC and the AIPC training. The associate training that that has fewer requirements. So, I, I were you asking about who will be training or what what training? What training? Yeah, what, what training? There yes. is the CIBC. Uh, the there's the if you go to CIBC, they talk about the various tests, various certifications that you can take. 
So the CIC test is a more uh, elaborate uh, version of the certification uh, from the back of my head. It's like a four on the top of my head. It's four hour long test, but the associate degree is a shorter and uh, like a, for the newer people, uh, for the novice who is just kind of stepping into infection prevention and control, the AIPC is the test. So, oh, wonderful. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, you're welcome. It's something to keep in mind is that the Project First Line funds all that training. So uh, if you're receiving the grant, you can build towards the grant um, and get whatever staff you want certified. This is Crystal. So I do sit on the APIC um, committee that we look at academic and education, and we partner with the CIC or CIVIC as well. And just for awareness, and I do understand the challenges and struggles because this was brought up. Um, for that CIC, you have to have a minimum of a bachelor's degree. They are not going to budge on that because uh, we did have a very uh, tough and challenging discussion revolving around that because there are LPNs that have been in the field for an extended period of time. Um, so just know that is being spoken about, and, but it is not going to budge. To get that CIC, you will need to have a bachelor's degree. It can be in nursing, uh, in microbiology. Um, I've even seen respiratory therapists. Uh, so, you know, they are definitely opening up that field. The APIC um, one is available for associates. It's not intense, um, but there is a world of training out there. And if you want more information, you're more than welcome to reach out to me and I can put my email in the chat. What yeah, I and thank you for that, Crystal. And that's why, you know, we're focusing on just the ones that our licensed um, vocational nurse can qualify for. So we understand there's a variety of different options for training, but it's not going to fit, fit our need if they're not eligible to participate. So we're looking at the ones that um, match their level of, sort of them as a clinician. I appreciate that because I will bring that back to the committee just so that they are aware there are people that are looking for that. So I will bring that back. To the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions for me? Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Kashala. Okay, now we will hear from uh, Johnny Delgado. So Johnny, um, it's all yours, feel free. Hello everyone, my name is Johnny Delgado. I'm the HR Generalist uh, Grants Program Director at Bakersfield American Indian Health Project. Um, I do have additional roles that are not in my job title. Uh, I am the safety and compliance officer, um, as well as I do IT. And I'm also getting into policy developments as well as my role moves more into grants management. Um, I've been with uh, Bakersfield American Indian Health Project for three years. I got hired on it as a admin, uh, admin assistant HR coordinator. Um, and since then my role ha continuously evolves. Um, next slide, please. All right, uh, BIHP was originally established in 1997. Uh, the Bakersfield American Indian Health Project is an urban Indian health project funded by Indian Health Services as an outreach and referral center. It is the only Indian health care facility in Kern County. BIHP serves a client population represented over 220 tribes across the region who currently reside in Kern County. Uh, our mission is to serve the American Indian Alaska Native people reside in Kern County by providing services that contribute to the health and vitality of the community in a respectful manner with high regard for cultural values, tribal affiliations, spiritual and personal values of individuals. Our vision, uh, BHP envisions a vibrant healthful life for future generations of American Indians and Alaska Natives in Kern County 
By delivering sustainable, culturally integrated services and fostering continuous community connection and whole wellness. This is BIHP's third year of participating in the Urban Indian Organization uh, Infection Prevention and Control uh, Champions Program with the National Council of Urban Indian Health. Uh, slide, please. Um, so we have, uh, we're more outreach and referral on the medical side and more primary care services on the behavioral health side. Um, so we are, uh, as an outreach and referral, we have uh, prescription referrals, uh, public health nursing assessments, intensive case management, diabetes, uh, case management, health education, payment assistance for healthcare needs, uh, that's all through referrals and um, direct pay services, referrals to primary care providers and specialists, residential treatment. We actually um, have a contract with the Friendship House and we will actually transport clients to um, that residential treatment facility. Where they receive cultural holistic services. Uh, assistance with applying for CalFresh and Covered California Benefits and assistance with resume development and submitting job applications. Uh, next slide, please. As a more of our outreach and referral, our primary and supportive services, uh, we have talking circles for elders, veterans, and women, groups for youth, suds, gardening, drumming, beating, and regalia making, uh, food, we have food baskets, uh, Classes, parenting skills, we're actually in the process of getting staff certified uh, through a state certification to be able to deliver those so they'll meet, um, so that they'll be able to get a certificate um, saying that they're certified by the um, state curriculum. Bingo size, wellness, uh, bingo size is like exercise meets uh, bingo, uh, which it's more geared towards elders, which is very engaging, they love it. Uh, wellness and nutrition, COVID-19, we still offer vaccines. However, our vaccine rate has uh, dropped drastically over this year. Uh, boosters, testing, and PPE. Counseling services uh, through our behavioral health department are available for individual, group, family, couples, depression, anxiety, trauma, informed care, anger management, grief and loss, and parenting. Transportation, we offer to and from BIHP, medical, dental, behavioral health, and vision appointments. Next slide, please. Impacts of COVID-19. Um, so pre-COVID-19, uh, BHP had very limited resources and services. Um, our EHR system was RPMS. Um, as any of you have used RPMS and have switched off of it, um, may realize the limitations that it has to offer. Uh, everything was paper charged. Uh, with the pandemic hitting, that was a huge issue because every document touched had to, we had to be very careful to either properly disinfect or wear gloves. Uh, which wasn't the normal process. Um, and then additionally, if a client needed care and we didn't have access to the office to, to being shut down for disinfection, it limited what services we were able to offer because everything was paper charts. Um, so that was definitely a, a big issue with it since we couldn't, uh, we weren't set up in a capacity to be able to run our operation remotely. Um, we also limited community engagements because we're not reaching our full clinic. A lot of it's getting out there in community and advocating for services, uh, which put a halt to our ability to effectively engage the community. Uh, we had IPC limitations, uh, staffing. Uh, I mean, everybody I think is still ex experiencing staffing issues as a result of the pandemic. Uh, we took a, a major hit for it. Um, the biggest thing is, you know, if we had to shut down our operation, it was, you know, how are we going to pay staff uh, for one? Um, and then another thing was um, a lot of people didn't want to work in the pandemic. We had people that left and they didn't feel comfortable working in healthcare. They were afraid. Uh, but, you know, when you work in healthcare as an organization, whether it's behavioral health or our medical side of things, it's we're one service, we're an integrated service model. Um, so we had a lot of issues with um, staff struggling to adopt to, to adapt to the changes that we've had to go under through, through the COVID pandemic. Um, our practices needed to be revisited. Uh, definitely had to revisit on the way we normally ran our operation, um, such as shutting down the clinic, limited amount of people in the clinic. Uh, we would have clients, uh, uh, and I make, but uh, most, I'm guess I'm going through pre-COVID, uh, pre-COVID though. Um, and staff knowledge was definitely an issue as well that they had limited knowledge of, um, of proper infection prevention and control uh, processes. Um, as education as well as how germs and airborne transmittal disease are, are carried on. Uh, we had facility limitations. We had a shared facility. Um, it was a large building that we um, leased out certain spaces of it, uh, which our staff were split in certain portions. Um, but because of that, it offered a lot of limitations of when the pandemic hit of how we keep our staff safe 
where they had to cross through common hallways with other shared business space. Um, and also transportation limitations. Our vehicles weren't set up to properly disinfect. There were cloth material uh, with it. They didn't have any barriers in it. And um, it created issues if, you know, we transported somebody for, let's say, to get testing um, for COVID, who you think is positive, how do you disinfect, you know, cloth material? It soaks into there. So uh, we had a lot of limitations because of that. Um, as a result of COVID, though, we worked through the pandemic. I'm lucky to say we only shut down as an organization, I think, for about three or four days in total throughout the entire pandemic. Uh, we were able to remain open for the most part um, at limited services. Um, through that, we expanded the services uh, and our resources during the, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, part of the way we expanded resources and services was through community collaborations and upgrading the systems we had in place, more so our infrastructure. Um, during the pandemic, there was a large support from the U.S. government where uh, there was a lot of money given out to UI, uh, to organizations to upgrade their infrastructure um, to under the pandemic. And we really utilize that investment to the core of their operation in which we purchased the EHR system. So we moved away from paper charts. We were able to upgrade our server and our phone system. We got off the analog, you know, phone tone, uh, phone lines to a VOIP, uh, VOIP setup. We're actually able to take, if need be, we, I can take my desk phone home. I can plug it into my internet at home and voila, it's my connection. You can reach me there, all the phone, and we can control where phones are getting routed to. So we really upgraded the infrastructure to be able to go fully remotely if need be, um, but at the same time work in the office as well. Um, and so there's a lot of thought, a lot of work was spent into that infrastructure upgrade, um, but now we're set up to easily expand. In the event this facility goes out, power goes out, we can send all our staff home and technically still have them work remotely. Um, we also expanded our scope of uh, RPC um, project. Um, part of that was we were looking at just the addressing, you know, PPE for one, uh, training, some development, but we've been looking beyond that. A uh, big chunk of that is looking at uh, like Triple HC accreditation. Um, with that as well, we, we had Nakui come out and perform a, a, an assessment. Uh, I think it's chapter six and seven is IPC for the Triple HC. Um, we were, no, we know. When I invited Nakui out, I know we weren't ready to really lead on that project, but I needed to establish a baseline. I needed a third party organization, you know, somebody separate from us to really evaluate where we're at and give us feedback um, and establish, you know, where, this is where you're at now, this is where you need to be and answer questions we have on it. I'm not, I'm not APIC certified, I'm not a, a, an RN, you know, I don't have a medical background, um, but I do have some experience with safety and dealing with OSHA and a general knowledge note that to know enough that this is important, that we not just set our organization up for this, um, for AAAC accreditation, but we also protect our staff. You know, we're, we're doing it for our staff, we're doing it for our, you know, our clients, the elders, the community, it all ties down on what we can do in our daily practices to really make a difference to everybody though. As simple as me covering my cough can uh, potentially protect the next person from getting sick who potentially could get sick and carry that to their grandmother, their grandfather who might be sick, you know, something can happen though. And so it's really caring enough to uh, protect myself from others and establishing that concept in our workforce to know that their decisions they make impacts everybody else around them. And so our training program uh, that we came out with, the, you know, we have the standard trainings that are required for our staff, such as bloodborne pathogen, our emergency action plan, hazard identification, accidents investigation, uh, proper PPE, you know, masking, donning, doffing, um, goggles, safety glasses, the whole setup. Uh, hazardous communication, patient handling, and we also have additional supervisor training as well, specifically for the managers on how they'll invent if something happens though. And that was something that wasn't in place prior to COVID. Um, and with that knowledge in which we learned and even pushing out that training is now we're taking that step further and we're working towards a triple HC alignment um, and integrating additional uh, practices in place to really complement that and even to uh, writing out SOPs where they need to be. Um, our facility uh, expansion, we expand our facility at the time, uh, as I stated, we leased out a portion of a building. Altogether, we had roughly about 5,000 square feet leased out. Um, through the funding received um, through the American Rescue Plan, we were able to put a hefty down payment on a building, uh, which actually we pay less for our mortgage on the building right now. What we're, than what we were paying for rent at the building we were at, and we tripled our, um, our facility space. 
Um, expand, uh, transportation, uh, we purchased some vehicles with some COVID funding as well. And we also, during the pandemic, retrofitted our vehicles. We put barriers in there. Uh, we put even a intercom system to be able to communicate to passengers that were in our much larger vehicles who may not be able to hear the driver. Um, and we equipped all our vehicles with masks in there, uh, gloves in there, disinfecting. So after every transport, they would disinfect the vehicle. And it, um, it did allow the clients to feel a lot more safer knowing that the vehicles would be maintained and that appropriate PPE was, uh, uh, was available for them. Um, the future of, um, of our projected uh, outcome with the, uh, sorry, the future of our project first line for us though, uh, in terms of the program itself and uh, Nikui in general is um, mostly uh, determined by what funding is available and whether or not, you know, UIO is covered and increased rewarded will be rewarded but it doesn't mean if the funding ends, the work ends. Um, we're set up in a place now and have enough knowledge and enough resources to know where we need to go and what we need to do. Um, and moving forward, we're just gonna continue to invest in our infrastructure, invest in our processes, work on the feedback we receive from Nakui um, for the AAAC accreditation, um, and then move forward from there. Um, I think I covered everything. Any questions? <laughs> I'll take that as a as a negative. Um, I do want to say hi, Felicia. <laughs> I haven't seen you in a while. Hope you're doing well. Hey, Johnny. Really good to see you. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. You as well. All right. Uh, thank you so much to our UIO representatives from Fresno and Bakersfield for sharing your insights. Uh, if your UIO is also interested in speaking on your experiences with infection prevention and control, please contact our team at IPC at nikui.org or fill out our UIO spotlight participation form. Okay, now we have a few minutes, uh, so we'll do an open floor. So please feel free to ask any final questions or give any comments. Um, if you do, please, uh, if you do share, please unmute yourself um, or drop some, drop a message in the chat, okay? We'll give it a few minutes before we have closing remarks. Uh, this is Johnny. I don't really necessarily have a feedback necessarily. I just kind of want to share something since nobody else is talking. <laughs> uh, with uh, Nakui's help, uh, we developed a really cool logo. I think it's uh, pretty nice. It, has a little, um, it comes from their Be A Good Relative campaign. Uh, I don't know if everybody can see that just fine. Um, but it says Be A Good Relative on it. It has a little Nakui uh, symbol on the mask there. And of course, our logo. And then on the back... Um, we have the Be A Good Relative, and then part of the um, the whole Be A Good Relative campaign, uh, one of the things that were stated in there was for the elders, for the youth, for the future. Um, and so this is how we're getting the, we just got these shirts in yesterday, and I just uh, gave them out to staff uh, since yesterday, so they're really liking them. I now sent them out an all staff meeting, but I'm handing them out, and everybody's asking, what are these for? We're getting extra shirts, so I'm going to type in a very worthy email and Send them out to links to the Good Relative campaign for them to really do it. But um, one of the re one of the things that we've done with Project First Line, which I failed to mention, is really looking into the promotion of the, as I said, to the activities of it. And part of that is, you know, buying a shirt to really send the message out there, buying equipment so we can print posters to really engage them, and developing other types of media. Um, I know Nakui's working on some stuff, and we've been looking around for for additional stuff, but. You know, we're set up in a way once we get the media produced that we're going to indigenize the community with the cultural appropriate material because it makes a difference. So it's not just giving the training. It's not just saying, hey, you need to do this. You need to do that. Checking off a box saying you met that requirement on the checklist. It's about really sending that message home and really instilling into your into your staff that what you're doing is important and everybody else, your decisions affect everybody else. Um, part of the, one of the messages that I see conveyed um, in behavioral health quite often is that, you know, the seven generations, the decisions you make um, affect seven generations. And you want it to affect things in a positive light. 
um, you know, taking from that example, uh, which is not necessarily the same, <laughs> but the decisions you make, though, in terms of how you protect yourself from others affects other people's health and well-being. And we need to be respectful of others um, and what we can potentially, what harm we could potentially do to them and just be safe and, you know, have you know, practice our best practices. Thank you for that, Johnny. Yeah, you know, representation does really matter, especially with the UIO settings. So we appreciate you sharing and all the innovative things that you are doing. That's pretty phenomenal. All right. Uh, so now what we're going to do is our closing. Uh, so before we close today's event, we'd like to remind you that Nakui has an IPC assistance center that you can join to access and share resources, interact with each UIO, our other UIOs, and more. You can also visit our website, email our team, and listen to our podcast. Okay, uh, we also have some upcoming events. Uh, we have more community of the learning events coming up later this year that we hope you will attend. Our next session will be on August 9th. Uh, Nikui also has additional events coming up, such as those that you see here. Okay, and these are our references used today. All right, finally, to earn continuing education credits for attending today's event, scan the QR code on the screen or use the link that is shared in the chat. As mentioned previously, you must complete Nakui's anonymous event evaluation survey in order to access your link to receive continuing education credits from Curtia Services. After submitting your Nakui survey, you will have the opportunity to enter in a raffle to win a prize from Nakui. All of this information will also be shared via email with you all. Thank you for attending today's event and have a wonderful rest of your day.